Hey, man, we are back, man. We are back. We are back, man. We back right now with another great live segment for you guys. We live, man. Stream yard, man. We all the way over in Turkey, man. We in Turkey, man. We in Turkey, man. Houston and Watts, man. We in Turkey, man. Collaboration, man. OE 2023, man. Split DTV, man. Hey, listen, man. As y'all know, man, I live it. I walk it. I talk it, man. I can back it up. So I decided to say, you know what? I remember when I came on and I told a couple of my old death row stories and certain things that happened in the past and cats want to question, you know, whether this happened or not, in a sense. And since we're on this internet, you know, this internet, you you can become anybody and any, anything. But, you know, I come from a world of reality. I am who I am. I know who I know. So what I decided to do, man, was do something special for the people today, for TV Land, and for my supporters. As I was doing this uh, segment last week, me and Unc, you know what I mean? And uh, we were doing this segment based on Joe Morant, the young NBA player, and um, all the trouble and the controversy that he was bringing upon himself in the game. Um, nigga, it's John Morant. Nigga, I know Joe Morant. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> mute, mute yourself back. Thank you. John Morant. Thank you for that correction. Damn, hit him with the Tito Jackson shit. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so, so anywho, we decided to do something on that topic, man. And uh, in the mix of that, I brought up this subject of someone that I knew personally, man, was a good friend of mine, a homie that I knew back in the days, man, who had that same very opportunity, if not better. But I knew this cat was a... This kid, was a hit, at his time, in his era, this kid was a great b-ball player. Um, he knew the game. He loved the game. He just got caught up with the game of the streets and not the game of the game. So with any further ado, man, I want to bring on, you know what I mean? Of course, I got my I got my partner in crime rolling shotgun with me as always. Uncle Spliff D in the move. Spliff D TV. I'm picking up some of that stuttering from him, you guys. But I got Uncle Spliff in the building, man. Spliff is riding shotguns, so don't y'all don't think he's not here. He's right here riding shotgun. And right now, with no further ado, man, I want to bring in my homie, man, a great former NBA player, man, a player who was um who didn't really get his chance to do what he set out to do in the first place, but he still ended up with other experiences, and we about to share those experiences with you guys right now with this exclusive interview. Um. We're going to go all the way down to his childhood and bring you all the way up to the presence, man, of to his coaching today, man. Hey, man, with no further ado, man, I want to bring on my homie, my partner, someone I knew, man, had the pleasure of meeting, man, over a decade ago, man, and we still connected, man. He reached out to me. He seen the interview I did with me and Unc, and he reached out to me, man, and told me to keep pushing my line, doing what I'm doing, man, and he behind me a thousand percent, man. Hey, Mr. Keith Cross is in the house, y'all. Keith Cross is in the house. Keith, what it do, homie? What it do, man? How you boss feeling, big homie? Or should I say Boss Claus? Boss Claus is in the house. Man, known worldwide as Boss Claus. Boss Claus, what's up, homie? How you feeling over there in Turkey? Hey, man. Another day in paradise, man. It's 11, 11 p.m. You know, 11, 11, sit man. here, sip it on that good Turkish coffee, man. Living 11, a blessed life. 11, 11, huh? Yeah, man. Hey, well, look here, nigga. I ain't gonna let you get away with it, nigga, because you and Spiff was talking that shit while I was off camera. <laughs> Y'all was on my heels. So I ain't gonna let yeah, you get away with it. Yeah, yeah. We had a great job. We, 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 hey, hey, we enjoyed it. We thoroughly enjoyed it, man. Yeah, nigga. Don't, don't, you know, don't, don't hey, get on camera look, my show and act like you was woke over there in Turkey with me and Spiff blew your hey, phone up two hours ago. Listen, listen. You told me you gave me a specific time. You know what I'm saying? It hit me early because you forgot the time. See, at, at, you know, that that's what it's like to be old. You know, but I, I get it. I get it. You know what I'm saying? As long as I keep living, I'm going to be there. Because that's, that's, that's right. what y'all used to tell a young nigga. 
keep living, nigga. Keep living. That's right. You know? That's yeah. So but, you know, I felt, look, hey, it felt good, though, being able to talk all that shit like that. I felt safe, nigga. You know? I felt <laughs> shit. I felt like, I felt like, you know, some of these internet niggas, man. You know, yeah. Real safe over here. Out of reach. <laughs> Microphone reach up. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, so look, behind the screen. So look, man, dig it right in, Mr. Klaus, man. Uh let's start off, man, with let's let's give TV Land some of your background or your childhood background, man. Where where were you born, man? Where you come from? Where were you descended? And uh which which that was kind of two questions in one. So let's let's start with that first and then I'll I'll move on. For sure. Yeah. Hey, I'm a Hartford, Connecticut native man off the North End, Bellevue Square Housing Projects. You know, uh, moved to, I moved to L.A. when I was five years old. Moved over on the west side, you know, right there at uh, Red Heart University, 92nd in Vermont. You know, that's where I landed in L.A. back in 1981. Hey, I, 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 sure, I sure like how you tagged that, though. Red Heart University. Yeah, man. Hey, and, and, yeah, and, man. And Love just, to the land. Hey, listen, and just for the record, see, that was, that was between the grooves. A trays and them DLs, man, different lanes, man. You couldn't fuck around with Bread Heart, man. You got to know these areas, man. You heard what he said, TV. Yeah. Bread Heart University, man. That's a cold school, man. Bread Heart University. So, okay. So, born in, um, you say Harvard, Connecticut? Yep. Harvard, Connecticut. So, basically, yeah, you, were, so you were born I'm, there. I went from the, yeah. And you, your parents descended to California. At, at five years old, so basically you from you from LA, basically primarily. You born because I was born right. in Kansas City, you know what I mean, but raised primarily here. And so you came here five. You landed um on on the West Side in the nineties with the Bread Heart. So at this time you're you're about 12, 13, junior high school, right? Correct. No, I was five years old when we moved over there. Okay, but about to, oh, oh yeah, you, you lived in the area that I was five years old. old. Yeah, you, right behind Bret Hart. Did you end up going to Bret Hart? Nope, I got kicked out of LA Unified in fifth grade, man. I ain't even make it. <laughs> now, what is you it know what I'm saying? What the hell is the fifth yeah. grade get doing get kicked out of the fifth grade, Close? How that happen? Man, all kind of shit. You know, because I'm a light-skinned nigga with freckles, skinny, taller than everybody. So, you know, hey, we, we come from an era where, you know, uh, you run your mouth, you get tapped on, you get your jaw tested. You feel me? And so I was one of those that liked to test that jaw. So I spent a lot of time in that principal's office, man. And, you know, LA Unified had to get me up out of there. So you were snapping, you got in a lot of fights. They yeah. So basically. Yeah, I used to love fighting. So, so kids. Was nothing. Try, so, so kids would try to test you, make fun of you because of your height and your looks, and you had mm -hmm. to that ass. Gotcha, yep. gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Took one. Hey, look, the worst ass whooping I took was on the playground, nigga. Shit. Like fifth grade, right before they booted me out the uh, out the district. Little motherfucker, too. All the four foot nothing. Whoa, and quick as hell. Whoa, my lanky ass out, BJ. <laughs> <laughs> nigga, I couldn't do nothing with him. Nothing. He was just too fast. Nothing. So, so, so okay. So, after... Receiving your your title from uh, from the Los Angeles School District, that hey, we don't want this light skinned tall guy in none of our school districts. You had to get busted in, right? Yeah, I was out uh, Shirley Int Intermediate out in, uh, no Shirley Elementary School out in uh, Reseda. Reseda. So yeah, taking, taking you to Reseda, of course. Now that takes your mind to a different tone, right? Is is that when? Things start happening as far as the basketball because I'm I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm gonna take us to different levels and layers of it. So what I'm doing now is I'm starting off in your childhood to give TB Land a background of where you come from, which is your childhood. Now we know at five, right. you know this hard head nigga got kicked out of school at an early age of five. I know a gang of individuals got kicked out like that, but damn, it was like at least twelve or thirteen or fourteen. But this no, I was twelve, five. fifth grade. Okay, got gotcha. fifth grade, twelve years old. So. Just constantly and consistently having fights at school because of your appearance, 
and peer pressure, man. Right. Because we come in an era of jokey jokes. Niggas want to crack jokes. Called, we called it the dozens. So you come in an era right. of the dozens being played on you. And so from there, they called your moms, called her in, told her that, you know, he's no longer welcome in the districts. So I, they had to figure something out and get you busted. So you got bust from there. And what we mean by bust, yep. uh, for, for those who are not familiar out there at TV Land, what we mean by bust is basically commuting from a different community to a different community, which is better communities of high schools and junior high schools and elementary schools that are not in our community in the sub suburban areas or the valleys of Los Angeles. So this is what happened to Thief, which was actually a good opportunity for him living in that neighborhood at that time to be bust at 12 and you coming from out of Bret Hart area. That was a good opportunity for you and your parents actually for your education wise. And look, fucked around, did the same thing out there. Got kicked out of there. So, yeah, we, we ended up moving out to the San Gabriel Valley, the Baldwin Park, you know, and uh, <clears throat> so you got kicked out, out of three schools out there, and then from there to the halls, you know, made my rounds at LP, Central, Silmar, you know what I'm saying, at the tender age of 12, man, you know, and uh, after that, ended up at Leroy Haynes and at Leroy Boys Home up in LeBaron. You know, and uh, my roommate at the boys' home was a cat from, uh, he, he was claiming BSV at the time, you know. And uh, I was like, damn, this, this, you know, this kind of awkward. Dude was cool, but, you know, we mad dogging each other, you know what I'm saying? But it was cool because, you know, the villain's way over on the east side, the low bottoms. And we over, you know, way over on the west side. We ain't really crossing paths in the street anyway. Right. You feel me? So, so let's, you know, so, so be pause, pause for there for a sec, Keith, and let's let's go back just a quick minute, because because now you're, you're you're mentioning the form of gang aspect or gang culture, so we want to be able to introduce that and let the people know that you have had some side of experience of that in your life in your program too as well, correct? As your upbringing, correct. because you actually lived in a predominant crip neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? Right. The nine deuce hoovers? Yes, sir. So, you guys ended up in uh, Bret Hart University area. You, you, you actually you moved right behind, smack dead behind Bret Hart. So there was it was in, it, it was embedded for you to learn and be conditioned because you was right there, central in the hood. You was in the lines, right, mind. right. But so the nine deuce, right, nine foes, going up big down. You got the one hundred sevens, one hundred fourth is all, all that y'all turf. So it was embedded. It's inevitable for you to, you know, to to learn the things that we learned from that culture during that time. And so um, now you come from there, you get bust out to um, Reseda area. Then the problem was you had adapt this attitude and this 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 temperament then for being in the hood already. So you was a fight. You like to fight, and then you had height. So, you know, you took advantage of all that, basically, right? Right, right. So now... See, I always had, always had a basketball in my hand. You know, you always saw me with a basketball. I, I was just going to get you. Know that was going to be my question. I, I, I was going to know how and when did the ball get put in your hand. That was my next question. So yeah, how, before, I even, before I even made it to California, only my, see, my family with the classes is either basketball or football, you know, and being in the projects. Well, no football fields. All you always find a basketball court in the projects, though. You can find a baseball diamond, and you can find a basketball court. You know, and we was always at the basketball court. You know what I'm saying? Um, one of my childhood playmates, a cat by the name of Marcus Camby, you know, who had a long, you know, NBA career, 15 year NBA career, played with the Rockets, the Clippers, uh, Portland Trail Blazers, New York Knicks. You know, I mean, homeboy. We used to play uh, crate ball. When we couldn't get on the basketball court, shit, we right there on the crates with everybody else. Not the OG crates, man. The niggas don't know nothing about them the crates. crates. You feel me? That's when you know you man. had to play ball with them crates, boy. You made you a Hell crate. yeah. You get creative. Hell so, yeah. Tied up to that tree or a laundry line and it's on. It's on. So is it safe to say you – so you said you've been always had a basketball in here. So that was even when you was four or five years old, you had your ball. 
Yeah. So, so, so basically, then it sounds like that basketball was was your therapeutic situation to go to, experiencing all the other stuff you start experiencing at twelve and thirteen as an adolescent in school, your fights, being hard headed. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So how how therapeutic was that to you? How how did you decipher it? How did you separate it from your anger and, and becoming a, a thrown to the gang culture as opposed to the basketball in your hand? How did you separate it? You, you asked how how it was therapeutic. Man, you know that that shit took you outside of you know outside of your norm. You feel me? It was it was that uh, that, that that breath of fresh air that that you know that you normally wouldn't get. Right. You know what I'm saying? It and like, uh it was like Yeah, man. High. So they get high. It was like they get high that you love getting high off of because it was it was like you said, it was mentally and physically therapeutic because you love the game. Just right. The of it, like, it, 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 it redirected that focus, all that energy somewhere else. Right. You know? Yeah. So yeah, they, I, they they you know, they tried to diagnose me ADHD. You know what I mean? That, Shit, there was no ADHD. The nigga just like what he like. You know what I'm saying? And I, you know, I was I was a little nerd. Keep it 100 with you, because the nigga was reading Encyclopedia Britannica up in class. You know, uh -huh. and then, and then taking it, you know, taking a test. So you know, and, and scoring high on a test. You know, right back to the Encyclopedia Britannica. You know, uh -huh. and uh, because that shit appealed to me. That shit was interesting. You know that. That's why I had that same, you know, had that same effect. So, you know, I'm learning, I'm studying the game. I'm, I'm growing up during the Showtime era. You know what I'm saying? My favorite player, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I kind of look like the dude, you know, back then. You know what I'm saying? High yellow, skinny. So, yeah, yeah. So, you know, the basketball, keep it 100. That's what saved my life. That's why I'm still here today. Let me mute this nigga. Let me mute this nigga. He talking too goddamn much. Hey, Klaus, I want to. I want to ask you a question, bro. You talked about uh, the doctors try trying to diagnose diagnose you ADHD, uh, and I notice uh, uh, right now when when we have problem children, that's the first thing that they go to. Oh, he's ADHD. How you feel about that? Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a cop out that educators use, you know, because they don't want to, they don't want to find a spot to, to meet the, meet the kid. You know, most kids are, are at a different, all kids are at different phases of their development, their growth and development, you know, and, uh, so you can't really fairly test everybody the same, you know, like I'm in a basketball you know what I'm saying? You could be in, in a soccer and BJ in a football, you know, but they're giving all of us soccer soccer exams. You know what I'm saying? We don't know shit about it, you know, and, and we ain't interested, so the focus ain't there. You know, we just standing there. We just standing there on the sideline watching. You feel me? So once they once they get everybody on a, on a level playing field, you know, things will be they'll stop testing kids like that. They'll stop being so quick to, to throw these diagnoses at these kids. You know what I mean? Nine times out of 10, the kid just ain't interested in the bullshit that that's going on in the classroom right now, you know, cause they, they, the focus is on some other shit. They're there, you know, but that's not, that's not what they're interested in. You know, a lot of times they're on some, some higher level, you know, shit intellectual wise. You know what I mean? And uh, they do a disservice to the kids by trying to pump them full of medication. See, what that did, what that event, you know, eventually did for me was had me nodding out of class like I'm a dope fan. You know, I'm sitting there like this, barely keep my eyes up where before I'm on point. You know, I got my textbook, but I also got that Encyclopedia Britannica. You know what I mean? So, now my work production has slowed because of that. You feel me? Because of that medication, my work production slowed tremendously. And, you know, they try to blame it on my behavior still. 
once that shit was out of my system, then it's all systems go for me again. And I'm flying, you know, and I'm right where I need to be academically. You know what I'm saying? So they like, again, they do a real disservice to our kids, you know, uh, just meet them where they're at. You got to be each one of them indiv individually where they're at, you know, and, and take it from there. And it takes patience. You know, as a basketball coach, I got to meet each and every one of my students, my players, right where they're at. Because I got some kids who are, even though they 10, 12, 15 years old on the same team, you know, 10-year-olds on the same team, 12-year-olds, 15-year-olds, not everybody's at the same level talent-wise. I got to meet them where they're at when it comes to their to their training. I got to take my time with a few of them, whereas the rest of them, I can accelerate because they're on an accelerated pace. You feel me? That, so that's, it's, it's that's interesting. Go ahead. I just want to touch real, hop in real quick and touch on what you just said, though, man. Because, I, and I'm glad that, that, that Unc asked that question, man. That was a great question that Unc asked because people need to know that, man. And you just broke that shit down so precisely and so good. And understandable that that shit is real, man. That just think about the unified school districts and how these schools and how sports situations deal with situations and study separating the categories. You just said you use me, you, and Unc as, as three different categories of sports, but they giving us the same one condition for this one particular thing that don't have nothing to do with us two. I don't like you say, I'm a football player, I don't know nothing about soccer. You basketball player, up the soccer player, we don't, but we all under the same condition for this particular thing. And then the medication itself, and then at that age, and then like you say, then I, I, again, I want you to explain to TV land what is cycling, uh, the cycling, um, um, Encyclopedia Britannica. Because a lot of people aren't aware of that. They know Google. They don't know what it is. They don't know right. what it is. Niggas don't have, they don't know about having a library card. <laughs> I, I, I pulled the almanac out on, out on the cats the other day and it flipped, flipped my boy out when I pulled the almanac on him because he was like, that. this nigga really went straight to the map. If this was what we were talking yeah. about things physically because it was embedded in us. We didn't have a digital world. But I just, I just, I'm, I'm just glad you touched on that, man, and surface on that because that was a good educational piece. Hell, you just educated me on that, man, and uh, that was dynamic, man. So being under that medication, did your your parents? Of course, they assigned you to the medication, right, through your parents. How did you get off of right. it to the point that you realized that it was slowing you down and slowing your education down? And, and take you out of your equation in class because now you're nodding like a dope fiend. How did you realize that to the point where you got off of it? I didn't really realize it. And like I felt, already felt different, felt off kilter when I was, you know, uh, using the medication. But it wasn't until I stopped taking it that I, that I was able to recognize the difference. You know, personally, it wasn't until after I was done with it, you know. So, uh, and as I was what, 13, almost 14 years old, you know, by then, stopped, you know, once I was done with it, what I mean by done with it, once I refused to take it anymore, you know, that's when it became evident what was going on with me, you know, what I had been through, it was almost like I was in a, in a, in a zombie state, you feel me? So, when you say you refuse, what what overcame that? It, like, was it just one particular night, one particular day? You just said, you defiance. Know, defiance, just regular teenage defiance. Yeah, yeah. I'm not right, taking it no more. Enough is enough. Like, yep. I don't like the way it's making me feel. Basically, huh? It was like mentally. Yeah. Your your, your, your mind. Up in that group mind. home, man. Up in that group home, in the you know, man calling. Nah, I'm not taking it. I'm cool. You know. Yeah. The, Keep me taking it. Nah, I'm not taking it. You know, and being threatened with being sent back to the halls. I don't care. I ain't taking it. Oh, you know wait, what I'm wait, saying? So wait, 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 wait. Oh, oh, wait, 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 wait. That's now that's interesting, and now it makes a lot of sense. See, I thought this was going on. It took place when you were home still, and you were with the parents. Yeah, 
but you were in group home. It took know? place. It took place initially at home, you know, with the schools. But they died. And then later. But they died. And then later. Troubles, right? Right, right, right. And so later, now I'm in a hall. Now I'm in a group home. They still, you know, I'm still may call going up there, you know, and make you check under your tongue and all that shit, you know, make sure you took your meds. And one day I, you know, I had enough. I'm like, nah, I'm cool. I'm not taking it anymore, you know. And that's when they tried to threaten me with the, you know, sending me back to the halls. And, I don't care. I'm not taking it anymore. Oh, wow. Well, I, I, <clears throat> That's a trying for your life, man, at a young, early age, man, that I commend you, tip my hat off on, because that was something that you pulled yourself off, yourself out of, homie, and that's that strength. So moving to your next experiences after you did that, and go, and you in your group homes at this time, you you, you what, you in your teenagers, you, you 14, 15, 13, what? Bonnie yeah, age? 13, 14, yeah. Okay, so now we're, we're 13 and 14. Um you, you, you involved with the gang culture. You got in, involved with the gang life and the gang culture. You still got your, your ball in your hand, though, because it's, it sounds like a bit of my experience, right? Like, I was undecisive. Like, I, I knew I didn't want that gang world, but I was associated because I moved in the hood now, so I'm an association. Then I went from association to an actual member because I'm running around with members. To the point where I be right. in the set, you know how I go when you from the set. Now we want right. to get work in. We really from the set now. Right now you full fledged gang banger, right? So right when I went to them stages, before I became an actual gang banger and actually folded and went all the way over, I was still a member. I had graduated from my association of moving into Nixon in 1970, becoming a member to a banger. Before I took those steps, I still had that football and my baseball bat in my hand. And I was still undecipherable. That was my therapeutic. That was my to go to to relax me. Every, everything about it, I loved it. The competition of it, out beating my opponent, you know what I mean? Knowing that I beat him out, you know, hearing individuals cheer my name because they see my greatness in me. So all those things was my therapeutic. And I loved it. And I see myself one day in the future doing it professionally, right? But I still had this cloud over here as a youngin, infatuated and fascinated by my OGs and my big homies and my elder peers who were gangsters and gang members, right? To the point, Fact. to the point where, and I want to know where where your separation, what made you go all in to a degree? Because my all in came with the loss of my parents. I lost my king first. I lost my little brother, then I lost my queen. And I mean, back to back to back, bro. And at a kid at 20 years old and 19 and 21 like that, bro, that wasn't a, a time fit to lose something of love. See, because we come up from an era where either you had both parents in your household, or at least you had a, a, a strong mother and a stepdaddy who stood, stood up to the plate who became your actual father. So we had the actual upbringing. See, the opposite of this generation is we really had the opportunity of parenting being our life. They got the right. opposite. They don't get the love that we got. So that's why it's so hard for them and to understand it. When we got the nurture, the ass whoopings, the spread of wide, and the love. Man. And, and the Man. And the teaching. We just was dumb dumbs and got bamboozled from the bullshit and rebelled anyway. When a lot of this generation kids didn't have a head start from the beginning from birth, bro, because they mamas and daddies or they mama didn't have a head start because she wasn't taught. And the daddy ain't even around. That nigga's an egg donor, sperm, excuse me, sperm donor. So he ain't even around. So the kids don't get it. Right. You feel me? So with, with that, that put me all in with my banging status. What was your time at, at, at be, be, between 12 and 14 at that age of being an associate of, of the hood or the non-deuces then? What made you go all the way out and go groove? Man, it was it was watching homies get hurt out there in the streets. You know, people people that I, that I had a lot of love for, you know what I mean? And uh, I wanted some get back. You know, that's that's what it was. Um, so 
it was like, fuck it. You win or what? Yeah, man. So you know, man. So it's it, so yeah, vengeance was my vengeance was my best friend. So you know, and then also I had I had this this evil stepdad syndrome at the crib. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, talking about a dude that used to beat on me like I was a grown man. You know what I mean? And uh from the time I was what, seven years old, you know. So pause right there. It was a lot of yeah. Pause right there, Mr. Mr. Klaus. That's interesting. Because now you not knowing at a young age, that really brought a lot of conflict in your life at a young age then. Cause it was a pound up of shit then. See? See, see Right, now, right. You, 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 and you and, and plus, you know, we from that generation, BJ, where is you know, the black household was like, Don't we don't talk about what going on in my house. That's right. You know what I'm saying? What happened in this house, stay in this house. And that fucked up so many of our people, you know, because we conflicted. You know what I'm saying? I want to tell the homie what's going on, but then I can't tell the homie what's going on because that's, you know, that's my ass when I, if, if it's found out. Right. You know, they find out about it at home. Nigga, that's, that's my ass. Yeah, so that you know what I'm saying? Thing. I remember the ass what I just got. Right. I want to get one of the worst. You know, I'm a light skinned nigga, so I bruise easy. You know what I'm saying? And then going to L, you know, going to school in LA when we was on tracks, we going to school during the summer. You feel me? Depending on what track you was on. And being out there with, with my little members only coat on, nigga, and a sweater on underneath it, trying to, you know, long sleeve trying to cover up, you know, in in my motherfucking uh my leaves, you know, my lee jeans, nigga. Is Hundred degrees out there, but shit, I gotta cover up them bruises. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So, yeah. I, I did what I had to do. You know, but one thing you were saying earlier, man. You know, the way we were raised, man, was different. The way the community, you know, really wrapped its arms around us, because we right. from that generation of it. It took a village, you know what I'm saying, to raise us. You know, and that. Reminded me of my, my project days back in Connecticut. Because, uh, you know, I used to go back some summers. You know what I mean? And, uh, man, when I got in trouble on one end of the projects, I don't get my ass whooped at every building. You know what I'm saying? Until I got home. That's right. You feel me? And then by the time I got home, you know, the nigga was tender as hell. You know what I'm saying? And, and they, they knew when I walked, Pops knew when I walked in the door that I had enough. Yeah. You know, so he sit me down for a minute and then I right, gone back out there. Yeah. You know. Because Miss Green and Miss Gladys down the street, they weren't playing that because they tight with your mama. Feel me? So they right. Tight and not only tight with your mama, but they tight with grandmama. They know your whole yeah. family tree. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I, I had a lot of love for my elders, man. You know, a lot of love and respect for my elders because uh, at, at certain points in in life, as we as we, you know, going through that maturity process, you know, we're starting to remember a lot of things, and not only remember, but now we're starting to define and and live in a definition of those things. Right. You know what I'm saying. In, in, a, in a good way with those morals and values that they instilled in us, you know, maybe we prevailed against it at the time because we were just too immature to understand it, you know, but with time comes knowledge, with time comes experience and knowledge. Yeah, you so feel this, me? This we is, were raised, man, look, we were physically raised by grandma, big mama, you know, aunties, uncles, you know, an older cousin maybe along with our siblings and mom and, and dad, or maybe dad wasn't there, but some kids were good enough to have a, you know, lucky enough to have a good step parent. Right. You know what I'm saying? The last 20 years, these kids, man, they've been raised by iPads. Right. It, it was you feel always, me? They've been always, raised by electronics. Yeah, it was always that condition of some form of authority or parenting in our life, like you just said, because we had older, elder cousins and relatives. It was elder. They was the babysitters. Feel me? They were right. Right. They were why the mamas, why the moms and pops and them play cards and domino nights. You know what I mean? So everything was structured. Yeah. Household. It was structured. 
feel me? So just imagine. Right. I'm, I'm gonna say this, then we're gonna. I, I'm gonna hit you with something else real quick. But just imagine if this generation, if we were to reverse everything right now, one day we just all woke up as a black culture and we go back into us, we spin ourselves back into a nation, right? And moms, pops, big uncles, daddies, big homies start chastising these youngsters on the blocks, is brandishing weapons in the broad daylight. And not being scared, you feel me? But just telling them right, not trying to challenge that or say, well, nigga, kill me, but trying to tell them, hey, youngster, you don't have to do all that. I mean, I, I get it. If you're going to experience your gang thing or whatever, okay, but at least have some form of values about it when it comes to the communities and the kids and the elders and the women of the communities then. Because right. OGs, the same niggas y'all kill the elders and the OGs that you want to ridicule and criticize, at least them niggas have some standards and some principles and values and some rules, man. So it's right, like, right. imagine if we went back to that raising a village and the villages start becoming villages again, that everybody on every block look out for everybody like we used to. Like, your kids can't get out of line around me. And I'm not going to say right. that. I don't like you. I hate you, or I hate the way your mama dress, or your mama and them think they too good. No, nigga, I'm finna chastise y'all ass and take you down there to your mama, man. Cause I got kids too, and I love my kids, and I hope they chastise mine when they get out of line. That's what's the mentality right. my parents was in, and where we come from. We don't have that, so it's so many different things as far as resolutions and solutions that we need to be speaking on, and and and, and topics that we need to be speaking on as far as that level. But instead. This media use everything against that, as far as that discretion. So, Perfect. so it's interesting, man, that you you started out with a young upbringing of a lot of turmoil. So this explains why once you got to the ladder and you finally in your mind, oh shit, I made, it. I'm at the top. You wasn't ready for that yet because of. A lot of that past probably came and resurfaced then. Is that safe to say? I took say? it with me. Yeah, I, I took it with me. I always had it with me. You know, I, I, I was dragging that bitch over my shoulder, you know, mm -hmm. like a sack of potatoes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And that uh, unresolved trauma, you know, and, and still experiencing more traumas along the way and just filling up that sack, you know. But I kept grinding in the meantime. Okay, you so... Know, so now we 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 in the juvenile phase. We going through boys' home. When was the transition, Keith? Where you decided to say, "Let me go on back to school. Let me revamp my education." Because you ain't never been no dumb dumb. You come up being educated. You come up reading. You come up being able to decipher things. So you had the mind frame like they tried to tell you you was ADD or you you was diagnosed with some shit of being mm -hmm. stuck. When you showed them that, it was the opposite because you kept that book in your hand as well as the balls. Yeah. When did you decide to, A1, let me go back to school and let me go to school and really get my education together and let me get on my b-ball thing, man? When did that separation come or was it a separation? Because I know it wasn't a separation completely because we're going to talk about all that. We're going to get to that, nigga, because that's when I come in at down the line. At, in your elder days, when you get older and, and you're up and you're in the NBA league. But however, when did you get to that separation aspect of things as far as the gangs, go to school, bounce my ball to the point where now I want to play. I want to play high school ball. I'm, I'm sure you played in a lot of Pop Warner leagues at first and then you went to high school. So how did that take place? How did you start entering into these leagues and, and, and then going back to school? So that's two and one. My first. My first real basketball coach was a cat named uh, Andre Basu, and that was at the boys' home. Say it again, you know, Andre. And, uh, Andre Basu. He worked for the county of San Bernardino for years. You know, I think he finally retired a couple years ago. If I'm not mistaken, but this dude, man, you know, he he was like a big, he was like a father and uncle to all of us cats that was in there. You know, he. And he uh he he gave that love, you know, in that direction that so many of us were lacking. You know what I'm saying? And and instilled in us that that support that we needed, showing us that we could do what we wanted to do, whether it was through football, 
whether it's through baseball, you know, whether it's through basketball. You know, our basketball team, we lost, but one game or two games in over a two-year period. You know what I'm saying? And we playing against AU programs. We playing against other group homes. We playing against juvenile facilities, you know. And I, I mean, we played Camp Rocky and Camp Alpha Bomb back then, you know, and, and that was a shit for us, you know, because we got to see homies that, you know, were up in the system now on a competitive field. You know what I mean? Oh, uh, but once I got out of there and start playing AAU, and then hearing about cats getting these scholarships, it's like, damn, I, I want a scholarship. Yeah, I'm playing in AAU. You know, playing AAU basketball, man. And shit, that was a game changer. Because now you playing against the best of the best from everywhere. You know what I'm saying? And then you get introduced to club. Then you get introduced to sponsor club basketball, Team Nike, Team Adidas. You know what I'm saying? Those were the biggest name brands at the time. Uh, L.A. Gear, Team Reebok. You know, they had their own teams. You know what I'm saying? And uh, the top the top tier players, the guys with all the buzz, the guys who, whose name was in the newspaper all the time, or in the Street Smith magazine, you know, not online, but on actual paper and black and white print, you know, where you read about a dude in the newspaper and then you finally see him on the court. Oh, that's so-and-so. Okay, let, let's see what he got. You know what I mean? It, and it was on and cracking, man. It was on and cracking. So how long did you play in that league? Like, how long were you in that league before you vast and went on? So how long did you play in that Man, league? Man, I, I, did, I did AAU basketball until I graduated from high school. And what high school did you end up graduating from? Sierra Vista High School in Bowling Park, California. Sierra Vista? Cause I wasn't, yeah, because I wasn't able to go back to LA Unified. You know, we, we tried, you know, but... There was a bunch of drama surrounding it, so yeah, they they wouldn't let me back in the district. So by the time by the time you got to high school and you got checked into Sierra Vista, do you think you calmed yourself down enough because you want to play ball? Was you still getting no. fights? <laughs> I was still getting in the fights. I was still sneaking back down to the hood. You know, I'm hopping on the bus. You know. Taking the old bus back down to LA, man, and uh, doing you know doing what we do, and then taking the bus back home, you know, tucking a burner under the mattress, and uh, shit, and go to school the next day. You were living two characters, just like me once before. He was trying to live a life to please and satisfy yourself, and probably get your family out of a poverty era or error that you felt you can do so through your basketball therapy, but then the hood had you caught up. So you lived a double life. 